All right, well, thank you to everyone for coming out to the first uh, Baron Studio Sunday School. Um, this is something that we're hoping to do every week, every other week. Honestly, we're feeling that out right now. Um, I just want to kind of go through like why we're doing this, okay? Because I think that really frames how we like to teach is, is we need to understand the why. Um, one of our missions here at Barron Studios is we empower the community and people around in the community. And there are so many people making music, especially here in Houston right now. And we come in contact with all these people and there are so many things that we're just like, oh, if you just thought about this better at the beginning or thought about this better at this step or this step, this would come out so much better, okay? Um, so rather than people having to go to MediaTek or HCC, there's a lot of just really simple basic stuff that can help you so much, okay? And so one of the things we hear more often than not is people talk about, you know, their software. We work on music, music's data nowadays, you work in software. One of the most frustrating things you can do is if your software gets in the way of your creativity. When you have an idea that you're trying to execute, it could be in a mix, a recording, working with MIDI, writing, anything like that, you don't want your software to get in the way, okay? A carpenter wouldn't go to build a house without knowing how to use a hammer, okay? Now, you know, uh, someone that really knows what they're doing, maybe they use a nail gun. Still driving a nail, but it's doing a hell of a lot faster and more efficient, and they're getting better results faster. And that's what knowing your software is, is about, okay? So, so we're gonna start by just kind of taking a look at Pro Tools, okay? Um, so, um, real quick, just kind of go around the room here, and this goes for people online as well, is what, um, like, why, um, what do you use Pro Tools for? Uh, tracking, mixing. Tracking, mixing, mastering, okay. Your stuff, other people? Uh, other people. Other people, okay, cool. Pro Tools, how do you use it? Let you guys use it, and I just come to rap. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but what um so what are what are you hoping to be able to get out of today? Oh, but wow. just to just to I was uh I think I uh, emailed you or whatever sent you a message on Instagram, mm -hmm. but just uh learning a bunch of like the terminology and okay. just getting myself familiar with everything. Just assumed, a little bit more so familiar, so you can be more efficient in your yeah. work. Awesome. Yeah. Online. We got we got online from uh, from Heavy Gat saying uses it for mixing and beat making. Mm. And production, bold choice for mixing. Okay, sure. awesome. Um, cool. Um, I use Pro Tools to track and mix. Okay, cool. Chris? Record and mix. Okay. Yeah. Uh, brute Force online on Instagram and Twitter. It's one Brute Force. He's running that entire I'm a producer and an artist, okay. so I use it to try to uh, mix and master all of my beats first. Mm -hmm. um, and then I not so successfully uh, record <laughs> off of it. Um, okay. It's pretty cool, but it's, uh -huh. it's not like y'all, so oh. I think I'm here just for that. Oh. Appreciate but, it. But uh, <laughs> recording and mixing it. Okay. And master on that cool. Video. Record, mix, and master other people and some uh, audio dialogue. Is, okay. Yeah. Doing like some ADR. So I'm trying to get good enough to do other people because yeah. I don't feel too comfortable with myself yet. Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. How I make myself sound, so. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Man. Well, well, what we're going to what we're going to start out by taking a look at is um, we're going to talk just a little bit about where Pro Tools came from, um, basic setup, and even our preferences of the software because there's a lot of stuff in there that people just miss that holds you back. Um, and then we're going to talk about some basic session workflow. Um, and really, these are going to be the, the ways that I like to work. All of this is coming from my experience. Okay, um, thirty six. I've been working with audio and a computer since I was 17. Started with Acid Music, no number. Yeah. Fruity yeah. Loops. Yeah, yeah the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just threw on my laptop FL, yeah. it's not Fruity Loops, FL Studio 20. You know, yeah. so I was like, oh, it's 20 years. I was like, yeah. shit. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so all of this is from my personal experience, okay? I never actually went to school specifically for audio. So this is literally just my experience. We're and working with lots of different people. Okay, so these are my best practices. So wow. that doesn't mean that these are your best practices. So that's why input from everybody is important because there's about a thousand different ways to do any one thing. So these are mine. So if you have questions or you have comments or stuff like that, throw them out there. Um, okay, so, so Pro Tools was actually um, created by a company that is no longer around called DigiDesign. It's created by two guys that played in a band. One was drummer, one was a guitar player in 1984. Um, so Pro Tools has kind of been around this idea for a while. The first actual version of it, I believe, was in 86. Um, um, was Pro Tools, once again, no number, 
Okay. Um, where basically it started from was the idea that you could just literally edit a single waveform. And it was like for sampling. Actually, technically it was called sound designer. Okay, so that's where it started from. Because people had drum machines and the guy was, was a drummer and he's like, man, I want to make my own samples and there's no way to do that. So that's where DigiDesign started from. Um, so it kind of grew over time, obviously. Um, so that was Pro Tools 1 then. Now we're kind of post Pro Tools 12. Okay, um, there actually is no number anymore. Now we have Pro Tools 2018. They've dropped the numbers. So they actually just released 2018.7, which the .7 is for the month that it was released in that year, okay? So um, Pro Tools, you don't really want to buy anymore, okay? So just for everybody here, like seriously, like a subscription thing, get right? on a subscription. I know a lot of people think that that's bullshit, and I'm going to tell you why that's not bullshit. When you bought the software, you did not buy the software. You got a license for the software, okay? You spend $700 on a pure copy of Pro Tools, and then two years from now, you're gonna pay like a three or $400 upgrade charge. And honestly, they support it, they're adding new features to it, fixing bugs, granted with every new release, they probably make some new bugs, you know. Um, so, you know, be careful with upgrading, you don't always upgrade immediately, but, um, but it is good to kind of stay up to date, and the subscriptions allow a company like this to continue to make improvements. Because it's like, cool, 25 bucks a month, Seriously, like, pay that if this is what you use. Even if it's just a hobby, 25 bucks a month, that's cheap. Yeah. You go to a movie. Like, you know, you go to, like, a, an IMAX movie, it costs more than that, okay? So, anyways. So, um, um, yeah, so that's kind of brief, brief abridged history of Pro Tools. Once again, actually a lot, a lot of really, really cool stuff in there, but we're just going to kind of skip over it for right now, for time. Okay. So, when we're starting up a, uh, a Pro Tools session, I'm going to come up here. I'm not going to actually create a new session, but um, we have what's called our dashboard, okay? And typically, we're going to go up here to create. It's going to ask you, where do you want to create it from? Their templates. Their templates suck. Don't use their templates. Um, collaboration and cloud backup, we're not going to talk about that today, but that's a way that you can have a Pro Tools session up in the cloud and like you could have access to it, record something, and then it would come down to my Pro Tools session so you can collaborate with oh, each wow. other really cool um today's not the day to go into that okay um but once again there's a lot of stuff that people are just like oh holy crap that's actually been in pro tools for a little over a year and most people are like mind blown about it okay so anyways in general you're going to be starting from your local storage hard drive that you have plugged in okay down here we got all these options here at some point we'll do a class on specifically what all of these things mean but what i'm going to tell you right now is Keep your stuff in wave format. You can do it in AIF, but wave format's really what you want. Um, sample rate, 44.1. Okay. It can go higher in sample rate. Um, 44.1 is what CD audio is at. That's been the gold standard of audio like forever. You know, since Redbook CD audio specs were created in the 1970s. That's how old CDs are, by the way. Um, that's why I welcome their demise. Um, Okay, I will still see people that come in and are recording their stuff at 48, because it's 48. That's like seven better, right? Like, that's got to be better. And technically, when you're recording it in Pro Tools, it does sound just a tear cleaner. Seriously, there's, there's so many other factors, like your room, the mic. It probably doesn't make a difference, but technically, it is better. When you finish your project, you have to put it back to 44.1 so people can listen to it. It sounds worse than if you had just recorded it at 44.1 in the beginning. That has to do with how digital sampling works and things like that. And we can get into that later. That's a really fun topic for me, but I geek on this shit. Now for bit depth, can you do, um, like sometimes I do 24-bit depth and then let the mastering engineer do the 16, look back down to 16? Exactly. Okay, that's, yeah, that's the next thing. So um, just, to, just to follow up on this, if you really want to be a go-getter and do a higher sample rate, you notice that we have these six sample rates here. Well, three of them are paired. So 44.1, what's double that? 88.2. Double that, 176.4. Just word of caution. Every time you kick up more samples, you are doubling the amount of data that you're going to be using on your hard drives, and you're doubling the amount of processing power. So if, let's say, at 44.1, you, um, you could run 20 tracks. Well, guess what? At 88.2, you can run 10. At 176.4, you can run 5. Okay? 
So you have to be really cognizant of this. We're in the age of streaming where stuff gets converted to AACs and is streamed online. Nobody gives a shit, okay? Like there are so many more important factors than sample rate. Put it at 44.1, set and forget. If you're doing something and delivering for video, that is where these come in. 48, 88.2, or sorry, 96 and 192. Those are for video. Film is at 24 frames per second. Like that's what film is. Well, so that 48 sample rate, make sure that the samples always line up to the frames of the film. Once again, it's all simple math, but it's just like, oh, okay, that makes sense. 44.1 is for music. And that has to do with the highest frequencies that we hear, 20,000 hertz. Um, 44.1 was the sample rate through um, a math equation made by a guy named Nyquist. Um, that he said, you have to have this, we have to sample a sound this many times a second to be able to have any chance of hearing 20,000 hertz in the audio file, the digital audio file. Okay? So Nyquist, the cool Nyquist guy, theory. gave us 44.1. Yeah. Yes. Okay? So that's where this comes from. All right. I was just pointing out, 24-bit, do your stuff at 24-bit, okay? Um, if you're going for CD quality, yep, Mastering Engineer is going to step it back down to 16-bit. Here at Baron Studios, we don't master anything for 16-bit anymore for CD audio. Everything we do is for streaming first and foremost. Someone has to be like, hey, I really need this for CD. Otherwise, we're going to leave more dynamic range in it. Um, well, this is a whole other class. but um, And we actually leave everything at 24-bit. Because when you upload to Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, all those places, they take a 24-bit WAV file. Let them dither it back, but give them the absolute best quality sound that you can, and you'll sound better when you stream. Okay? Um, there's no reason to do that. 32-bit um, float is an option. Um, we're kind of pushing the bounds of like just. I mean, once again, technically, it's better. But why? Like we're, um, we're we passed that kind of the inflection point. We're like diminishing returns. Like past this, technically it's better. Will anybody ever hear it or give a shit? No. Um, one of the things that I love about working in music and especially on the back end, the production and recording side of stuff, is the ends justify the means. Okay. So even with all the stuff that I'm talking about today in workflow, if you do it completely differently, and even if I looked at, it, I'm just like, oh my god, that's a train wreck. Why would you do that? If you put it out and people like the music, nobody cares, you know? So so just remember, the ends do justify the means in all of this. So just try not to get too lost in the weeds um, on this. So, But here are my recommended settings. Um, wave files, 44.1, 24-bit, and then also this checkbox here too, interleaved. What this happened, um, if any of you have ever imported a stereo audio file into, um, into Pro Tools, um, back in the past, you would get it would you would actually get a left and a right because a stereo audio file is actually two channels of audio, right? Well, and that was how Pro Tools always they only process mono. But well, now with when they leave, like if I import somebody's beat or their instrumental, and I look in the audio files folder of Pro Tools, it's actually still there as like a stereo file, which is which is just nice. Um, that's been supported since Pro Tools. Shoot, I don't remember ten or eleven. It was a long time ago. But anyways, it was a really welcome change when it happened. So anyways. So we're gonna go. We're gonna name the session. Um, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I'm I'm not actually going to hit create right now because that will shut off our audio for our live streaming friends. Um, but it's gonna pop up and ask you where to save it. Hey, what's up? So the one 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 other thing, and I I know this seems really basic, but seriously. Organize your files, where you put your files, okay? If you have a folder, label it Pro Tools Sessions, or if it's a project name or an artist that you're working with, name that and every bit of data for them goes in that folder. Every time. It doesn't hit the desktop, ever. If your desktop has more than like a recycle or trash bin on it, you're going to give me an aneurysm, okay? <laughs> Don't shit where you eat, and Pro Tools and your computer is where you eat. Or at least how you make money to eat. Okay, um, just keep it clean. Okay. Um, so anyways, yeah. So put all so put all your data together. Um, oh, if it's a new song, create a new Pro Tools session. Every time, create a new Pro Tools session. Name it. And also, don't name things untitled. Don't do it. I know it's like, oh, I just want to work. What's the first? Just a color, a blue, a feeling. A just whatever. Name it something. If you name it untitled over and over. 
you're going to be looking back at it six months later when you're trying to go back to an idea or a previous mix and you're like what the hell is this okay so anyway so cool um we've got our session created awesome so whenever i install pro tools for the first time i start just like a test session and actually i started on the desktop because i know i'm going to immediately throw it out um, <laughs> um but um but i come up into setup in Pro Tools and I go down to my preferences, okay? And there's some really simple stuff in here that can really speed up your workflow, okay? Um, so um, I like default track color coding to be on track type. So what does that mean? That means that if I um, that if I put in an audio track, it's gonna be blue. If I put in an auxiliary bus, it's gonna be green, okay? A master fader is gonna be red. So it just does that kind of by default you can change up and do it by, you know, you can have them automatically go if you grouped audio or if there were MIDI channels or not. And for, for me and the work that we do here, it's almost all audio, so we just go by track type, okay? Um, um, then you also have default clip color coding. So actually, let's real quick, what is a clip? This right here, it used to be called regions and before Pro Tools 12, now they're called clips. I, so if I say region sometimes, I mean clip, it's an old it's an old man habit of mine um, so this right here is a clip of audio notice it is the color of the track when I move it down here it is the color of that track when you have a lot of tracks going and channels going you can actually make it really easy to kind of identify what's what if you change the color of a track the color of the clip changes as well personally I like that it makes it really easy for me if I'm looking at something on the, that side of the screen and I look at this side of the screen, you're like, hang on, where, which track? And you have to like track your eyes back and forth. For me, that takes too much time. I want it to be the same color, so I'm just like, there, there. Okay. Um, these little things across, you know, across a four-hour mix, maybe just that right there saves me two or three minutes. Like that's, that, that's a gain just from like, and just not straining my eyes on something. So, I like having my clips be the color of the track. Once again, um, you know, see how much mileage you get out of that. Um, Plugins, okay. By default, it's gonna just come up by category, okay. Um, how about you? We have a lot of plugins, so I go to plugins right here, and it just has it kind of grouped by like you know I go to sound field, I go to other, holy crap, modulation, you know, and I'm just like, uh, mm -hmm. we have a couple different manufacturers that we primarily use. Um, we use um, our main our main go to channel strip, as you guys will see, is uh, is Neutron uh, two. Uh, by Isotope. This is a fantastic tool. Um, I only caution that it is so powerful and you can do so much with it that it's easy to get caught in the weeds and do more harm to your audio than is good. So you always have to be kind of checking yourself, but um, this is a fantastic tool. Um, so we use we use all, um, all Isotope plugs. Um, we actually use um, T-Rax Suite which is nice, and uh, universal audio, because we do run Apollos, okay? Um, for when you're like, you know what? I don't need clean, I want grit, I want something dirty, something that growls, I'm like, cool. I grew up and cut my teeth learning to engineer using, this is some of the gear that just hasn't been sold over the years, had a lot more, but like SSL, Trident, Neve, 1176s, like, I mean, these are really like the pieces of gear that like I'm just too sad to ever sell. <laughs> <laughs> Especially my 1176. What about the 1073? The we had more of them. We had more of them. So that's that's the last one. That's the last 1073. Um, and a big reason why I was okay with letting a lot of pieces go that I didn't have like the super emotional attachment to is because of Universal Audio. Their plugins are hands down the absolute best fidelity Sonic. Especially if you're going for analog modeling, that isn't always the best choice. And everyone's like analog's better. Analog's better. Analog's better. Eh. Um, I will, I will, I will debate someone on that. In, used in the right places, yes. Overused, it, it's really tough to make a modern sound in mix. You know, um, I'd rather something be clean because it's really easy to add character later. You know, um, a lot of digital processing should be like tofu. It's not bad, but you flavor it yourself. You know, you can make it tasty or not. You know, you can season it the amount that you want. That's what we like to use Universal Audio plugs for. So, anyway, so you see, it, there's a lot of stuff that popped up there. I don't particularly like that. I know that I know when I want to reach for a tool, I need to get it faster. So I actually tell it to sort by category and manufacturer. Okay, that's not a default. So now when I go to my menu, 
and I go to plugins, I've got that same thing here, and then I have my manufacturers here. So, oh, look, I can get in and find these, you know, faster. I mean, but the thing is, even looking, I go to Universal Audio. I don't know if you see this, this is literally going across three screens. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, like, so, so, yeah, trying to sort through and find, like, yeah, so normally I just go to, to, to that. Um, so, anyways, I recommend category and manufacturer on, on that preference, okay? Um, just so you can find what you need faster. Um, okay. Well, um, let's just keep going down. All that's fine. All that's fine. Okay. This is probably the most, <laughs> actually, no, this is hands down the most important preference that you need to set in your Pro Tools right now if you don't already have it. Auto backup. That's checked. And it comes up and it will auto save every 10 minutes and keep the last 10 backups. What you need to do right now, or as soon as you get home, you need to put it to keep the 99 most recent backups because that's the highest number it goes to. If we could put it to 1,000, we would put it to 1,000, okay? Um, they're small files. Hard drives are cheap. Save everything, okay? And five minutes seems to work really well for us. Um, in five minutes that I've made decisions and listened to stuff, if Pro Tools crashes right before the next auto backup and I lost five minutes of work and I load, that five minutes of work, I can normally replicate in about two minutes because I'm not making decisions. I'm just executing at that point. I'm like, oh, these were the moves that I did. Even if they aren't identical, I'm using my ears. It's going to be in the ballpark. And I was like, oh, yeah, I needed to deharsh that. I edited this. I time aligned this. And I'm just like, and we're back. Um, more than five minutes, that's about as long of like my previous moves that I can keep track of. Like my undo buffer is about five minutes. And I found that most other people seems to be about that. Um, if let's say you're doing audio and dialogue editing, I may put that shit like every minute because <laughs> the number of edits that you can do in a minute to, to audio, it could be immense. Um, so once again, use your own opinion as to what you need, but at least 99 and I recommend shorter than 10 minutes. Um, you, you know, we talk about pro tools needing to be a tool that enables your creativity and your workflow. If it's crashing and you're losing work, if you just lost 30 minutes of work, what do you want to do? Oh, walk away from this, okay? If you're like, oh, I lost five minutes. Ugh. Okay, that sucks, damn it. And you, know, you curse at Pro Tools and you just get back to work. And you're like, okay, it's not that bad. Every time I'm just super pissed off in the moment and I'm just like, okay, everything's going to be okay. You know? Um, so, um, so that's important. Um, uh, all of these things, leave them alone. <laughs> we've, we've tried messing with these in the past and Pro Tools can start acting weird and... Leave, leave these as defaults. Um, this is where it puts the settings, remembers where your plugin settings files are, all that stuff. Just leave them alone. <laughs> um, um, every, every year I get a bug up my ass and try to do it because there are some things that would be really cool for us here that would allow us to work faster and it always comes back and bites me in the ass. So, leave them alone. Um, okay, um, blah, 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 blah. all this is pretty straightforward. This is kind of fun. You can play around with it. In general, it's going to be all it's going to be all right. You can set default fades. So if you've ever been on the edge of Pro Tools and you double click in the fade file and it like by default just kind of, you can basically set what you want that default thing to look like. Once again, if you're doing a lot of work on something specialized, it's typically going to be more, you know, once again, VO work, things like that, maybe audio for film, maybe you change it, but it's also really easy to grab all the fades on a channel and, and select them also. Once again, leave all that alone. Um, wouldn't worry about that. Um, yeah, all of this, all of this is fine. Um, if you're doing production, a lot of production and a lot of time stretching of stuff and wanting to play around with tempo, you may want to check this box here, new tracks default to tick time based. Um, that allows the um, that allows the track to actually um, um, like, especially with like MIDI, it kind of like moves to like um, moves the notes to suit. So that can be useful. In general, I prefer to leave it off. Um, if any of you are one, let's say I don't want to do a deep dive into this, but any of you are familiar with tick versus sample time base, you can actually change that setting individually for any track by just clicking right here. Okay. Um, so I, I prefer, I personally, I say just leave it on samples, but there are some use case scenarios where you may want tick time base. All right. All right. We come over to mixing. Okay. Um, you can have your sends not like if let's say I have a reverb send like uh, like this guy here I could have this not come up 
Um, I could have this come up where, you know, it's going to be at like negative 20 every time, every time I put in one of these things. Um, I prefer to keep them at negative. I put them in because I want to bring it up from nothing. I always want to hear it go from nothing to something so I get to absorb the full change that's happening. If I hit play for the first time and it's already there, I don't have the same um, ability to judge it properly, you know? You know, you know, whenever doing something, you always go from nothing, you push it too far, you come back, and you kind of find that equilibrium, you're like, and that's the Goldilocks point. Um, so, um, so I prefer them, uh, it, I believe that should come up set like that. Um, okay, here's another thing that's really useful, I don't see too many people use, and it makes me sad, is you can go and set a default EQ. So like, here are all the EQ plugins that we could put. So in this case, because Neutron is just is just dope um, for just general track work. De definitely not mastering or anything like that. It's not clean enough for that. But I can set what my default EQ is. I can set my default dynamics. For default dynamics, I just put the full Neutron to there, the full channel strip. Um, so what that means, I don't know if you guys noticed, when I went into my plugin yeah, list, I see I have these right here. So if I'm working on a track out beat or something like that, or let's say I'm doing some other process, I'm like, oh, that's perfect, but I just need to do this one little thing. Cool, just give me an EQ right there real quick. There it is, okay? Um, and that's especially useful. Once again, I want to do too deep a dive, but you know, you have you have a real-time analyzer on this, which is awesome. Um, you've got your EQ points, and all of these points you can turn into dynamic equalizers as well. So that's kind of like a compressor or expander in each band. So once again, you can really jack some stuff up. You can also really solve some horrendous problems really quickly. So that's one of the reasons that we love Neutron. Um, so yeah, I can do that, or I can put in a full neutron to that quickly. Um, so, but you can do this with any thing. So I'm assuming once you find your like go to, like this is like, if I'm just like I need a compressor, I need an EQ. Those are just the things you reach for. They're always right there. You don't have to dive into menus for them. Speeds up your workflow a lot. Okay. Um, and like if you don't have those set, you're what's it, you're you're wasting time. Um, at the end of the day. Any, I will take any EQ in front of me rather than trying to find, spending time finding the perfect EQ. Okay, um, you know your time, your time, your life is more valuable than that. Um, this should always be set to, to samples. This is our delay compensation engine. So again, don't want to go into it too deeply. Other software does it by milliseconds. Uh -uh. It's got to be by samples. It's got to be sample accurate, or else your audio is going to smear and sound like shit. Um, okay, so um, we're going to talk about this more in depth, but um, if y'all aren't using K metering on your tracks and Pro Tools, you need to start. Okay. Um, when you come up here, um, you have your K, or you have all of these different, like Nordic scale, um, which are all cool, and some of them bounce around a lot and look great. K metering. Does, does anybody know what the K and K metering stands for? It stands for Katz. K A T Z. Once again, guy, mastering engineer, still alive wrote an amazing book that is like the holy grail bible he's starting to not be as relevant anymore um some people probably crucify me for saying that but um but a lot of really good practices and he's one of like the godfathers of mastering audio and he was always disappointed as audio transferred into the digital realm that there was no metering that adequately represented the way that we hear sound peak meters the standard meters that pro tools come up with bounce around like seriously, I wish you could just turn them off for a long time. Just use your ears. But K metering actually describes in a visual much more of what we hear. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. But so the, v, the VU metering is more like closer to what we hear, but not as accurate as the correct. K metering. Yes, VU is in the ballpark, but it's not um, the the K times and stuff like that aren't quite aren't quite right. And there's and K metering shows you both average RMS and, and peak, peak level. Yeah and puts it on a scale where you can judge the dynamic content of every track versus each other. Like, once you see it, you're just like, why have I not been using this? Um, okay. Okay. Um, so, anyways, so the defaults that all this comes up at, well, I'm like, K20 meter, awesome. Like, let's just do that. I can unlink these, and so I could have a different meter on my master. Um, like, whatever. I just make everything K20. Um, and we'll talk about with these other K, they all work the same, it just moves where your zero point is. We'll take a look at that. But um, um, I like having infinite clips on, so if a track is clipped and it went red, I like I like knowing about it, okay? So until I have to clear it. I don't like it like disappearing because maybe I'm missing something. Um, that being said, 
um, you know, we're all taught like don't clip your audio, don't clip your audio, don't clip your audio. If a track peaks every now and then in Pro Tools, it's not actually hurting anything. It's bad practice. You don't want to be in the habit of it. But the mix engine has so much headroom, it's able to take so much audio above the top of the meter before it gets any distortion. Um, that uh, it's don't don't beat yourself up too bad. But if it's just like clip 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 clip, yeah, let's do something about it. Something's something's not right. Um, okay. Um, a lot. Uh, processing. Um, okay. Um, only thing that's really important here on this one to make sure that you check is automatically copy files on import. How many people have opened up a Pro Tools session and had music in it and the clips are blank and you're like, why is this missing audio? Let's say the instrumental or the beat's not there. You have all their vocals, but you're missing the beat because this wasn't checked. That's, that's one really important. There's still another way you can screw it up. We're going to take a look at that. But this is the number one way that people screw this up because they drop their audio direct into Pro Tools, which I don't advise anybody ever does. Um, yeah, import. Use the import dialer. We're going to take a look at that. There's, once again, there's still a way that you can screw it up in that if you add files yeah. rather than copy files. But yeah. automatically copy files on import every time. Um, and if it doesn't come up this way, I don't remember if it does anymore, but if you do have to sample convert, let's say someone did give you vocals or something at 48, uh, start your session at 44.1. Let's say someone sends me a session to mix and it's all at 48. I start a session at 44.1, bring all their audio in, and it gets converted right then because then I know I'm working on what the end output is. I'm not working on something at 48 that all of a sudden I bounce it out and then it sounds different. Uh -uh. I'd rather take that quality hit at the beginning so I can mitigate it. It's not like, it's not like screwy, like. Well, if if you don't fully sample rate convert and it just plays the samples at a different speed, yeah, um, yeah. you definitely um, so don't have don't convert yeah. sample rate on input. Don't check that. Um, but this is the quality that it does with nowadays modern computers. The fact that they even give you a choice of anything but the highest quality. Back in the day, this took a long time to convert forty eight to forty four one. Now it's just like pfft, done. Um, um, anyways. Uh, if you're working in uh, film, you may use a third-party TCE time-shifting tool, and you have the, the tool, and you grab it, and it makes the audio longer. Um, by default, it's going to be Avid Time Shift. You see all of these here. If you buy these, some of these are better. Um, a lot of people will use those, and you can set that as the default. It's again, if you're doing um, like stuff for film especially. Um, MIDI, I don't use MIDI much um, in Pro Tools, um, so this is all pretty straightforward. Um, if you use wait for now, if you're doing a lot of composition, you may want to take a look at it, but we're just going to skip over that. Collaboration, we're not talking about that today. Synchronization, that's for film, okay? So we don't have to worry about that. So, um, all right, after running through all of that, anybody have any any questions, thoughts, like like clarifications, things they've ever seen? Yeah, I think we want to see the K meter. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're, yeah, we're going to pull that out. <laughs> but just of like the preferences and everything. In, in Pro Tools, like everything's like that. Again, those are our standard settings, and they work well for us. Um, once again, your mileage may vary. Feel free to tweak and play around for your workflow and style, but that's going to be a, a pretty good way to do it. So, all right. So, let's yeah. So let's take a look at K metering. Okay. So, so here's the thing with K metering. You can actually see right here. This is actually our talkback mic. It actually routes through Pro Tools, so it does an auto shut off thing. We won't talk about that now, but we see the audio moving here on it. Um, there's a way to make this a little larger, but not really. Um, typically, well, here, I'm going to change these into sample peak. Okay. So as I talk, you can see the level right here, and you see these little peaks right here, and you're like, oh, all the audio is staying right around, you know, there. Um, that doesn't describe how we actually hear. You can see that meter moving, like, really quick. you got a little bit of an RMS, but that's way too fast, okay? Um, we can go to a VU. Um, that's in the ballpark. That's close. It's a little gummy. Um, but a lot of people see this right here in a VU, and they're like, I have to turn that level up just because like, I can't have a thing that's barely hitting on the bottom. It doesn't make a difference, but you're just like, oh, I want to see more movement. It's more fun. Um, so a lot of people actually overgain their stuff. Um, yeah, we can go into all of these. These are a little bit better. Um, these, once again, are going to be used a lot more in um, like uh, video and things like that. Um, okay, so we like using K-metering, okay? So we see the whole thing flip around. 
First off, you notice our zero point is way down here, okay? And then up at the top, we have a 20 up at the top. If I put it to K14, my zero point moved up and now 14's at the top. And if I hit K12, the zero point moved up again and now we're 12 at the top. So it's kind of, it's, it's kind of like a game. So when we're working on something, I want whatever I'm working on, this bottom part that you see moving right here, that's kind of the RMS, that's the average, like the VU, the more modern VU part. And then we actually see this peak up here. So what this is actually showing me is the dynamic range of my audio. What is the average? And once again, as we hear the dynamic range, what's the average level and what's the peak level, okay? That's what we hear, okay? Um, it takes our brains a split second to process sound. So in a digital, it's like in and out, in and out, in and out. We don't hear it. We don't perceive sound like that. This actually, as you hear my voice, this is what we actually hear, okay? So my goal is, um, I'm actually going to mess with this right now. I'm going to actually, let's flip over and take a look at, um, all right, I've got this vocal here. Okay. Um, I've been wondering, wondering. So, I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? So we can hear as he sings, we can actually, if you actually hear when he pushes and holds that note more, you actually see the RMS of it responding to his voice. That's the actual level, okay? I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? But the other thing that's happening here is I can see that peak. That peak's sitting right around the plus 12. If, if his RMS was there, I would know that I had 12 decibels of dynamics. Now, when he pushes in harder, guess what? I know that I'm down to maybe like, you know, eight decibels of dynamics. Typically, a singer is going to have a lower dynamic range. Because if I hold a note, da, there's like zero decibels of dynamic range. Like, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just the same note. It's not, there's no difference in level, okay? Whereas, you know, we can go take a look at, you know, someone uh, like rapping a verse and we're going to have a wider dynamic range. Um, so this will help you make sure that your vocals all have about the same amount of dynamics in them. If they're all moving the same amount, you're going to find that all of a sudden they kind of sit together a little bit better. Um, so, um, so it allows you to just basically work your compressors and compare tracks to each other. So let's go over and let's take a look at... This is just a two track instrumental. So if I want to, I can take this and I'm just gonna gain this, we're doing anything, nope, no processing. I'm just gonna gain this way. the bases out of the dynamics that we want to match our vocal to. Um, once again, we can go into this more, but just start using K-metering, start looking at it. Um, I could talk about just this for hours, because um, it's really, really important. It will change the way that you approach audio and look at audio, and that's really set, important. Uh, K-20. Yeah, we only set K-20. Um, you can use any of them. It's all about just being able to get the number and making sure that you're having a consistent dynamic range of your things that are running through. Um, you could use one of the other ones, but I want headroom on my master bus. So um, your master bus, when you put it in, don't touch the fader on the master bus. The only time it should move is the fade in, fade out. And that should be one of the last things you do on the session, if you're mastering out of the session. Um, if not, let the mastering engineer do the fade. You can give them like a, a preview of how you want the fade to go, let the mastering engineer do the fade. It will always sound better. Because they can fade after the final limiting and it's smooth. Um, so, um, so yeah, we, we never touch, um, so we never touch like this. We're like, oh, I need it to be louder on my speakers. Turn this up. Don't ever do that. I will smack your hand if you do that. Um, this is sacred. It has to stay at zero. Um, we Once again, a bigger conversation. So if, you, if it's not loud enough, turn up your speakers. Turn up your headphones. So the goal is I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to mix typically 
for around zero, but at the same time, music should have some life to it. So if you hit the chorus, your RMS should push forward a couple decibels. If it's the same all the way through, that sounds boring. You know, your chorus didn't get bigger. Some parts have to be small for other parts to be big. When everything's exciting all the time, nothing's exciting, right? That's the build up. Yeah, absolutely. You gotta have peaks and valleys, ups and downs, <coughs> strikes and gutters. Isn't that why it's best, like, sometimes when you use an analog to, like, make sure the gain and the, the levels are set on the plug-in, or if you're using analog, the thing, when you instead say, of adjusting it on the on Oh, the yeah, yeah, absolutely. Always so the thing is, is with these meters, it also makes it real easy to judge and depending on what plugin your plugins you're using and how you have them set up if you're tracking with compressors and pro tools while you're recording things like that you may find that there's a sweet spot there may be a sweet spot like if i was using like one of those 1073s it does not sound the same in every click yeah it gets louder but it gets a little more growly and so you know there's a sweet spot in there that i want for different vocals so i can then i know where that corresponds with the level on this and I'm not looking at peaks because someone could hit a really hard P or T or S and that isn't actually the main component of their vocal, which is what I'm actually concerned about. Okay, mm. That RMS there, that's what's important. You can always put a compressor or a peak limiter on the other side just to kind of bat down just those little things. Don't be so concerned about the peaks. We don't hear the peaks. Okay, um, We hear the RMS in the way that moves. That's actually what you hear. Okay, so. Um, anyway, so that's, that's a quick intro to K-metering. I highly recommend that you go online and do some more reading about it, um, but very, very useful. Okay. So, uh, K-metering, I guess, is only available on 12 and higher? Because uh, I'm on 10 and I don't even have the option. Oh, yeah, I think, I think it may... It stops it may, that mixing, and then it goes to... Uh, <laughs> so I'm looking at a lot, man. Yeah, I think 11. I'm I think 11 they true. added K-metering. Man, yeah. I'm going to have to go home and upgrade. <laughs> Did you buy it? It's twenty twenty. If if you sign up for a year, it's twenty five bucks a month. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, so I, mean, I might do that because. Uh, and we we switched all we switched over to all subscriptions. Yeah. I've been buying. I I as well, money, but so. yeah, it's it's the Never way it goes. Again. Subscribe to a lot of plugins now, things like that. But anyways, yeah. it's that's how it's going. Definitely worth it though. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. So um. Let's see what time is it? Ten forty five. Oh, we're doing good on time. Doing good. We're actually getting through stuff faster than probably. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, K metering a little bit. Um, best practices. All right. So let's actually talk session workflow. Um, if I'm tracking, okay. Even if I have a tracked out beat for the session. Um, First, well, actually, let, let me let me back up even before that. I'm going to import the audio. I'm going to get my track set up. Um, we have a we have a template that's just very basic. Has just some channel set up, reverbs, delays, basic things like that. A master bus. Um, it has routing for our talkback mics, things like that in it. So we can just literally bring in that session, import it, and go. I highly recommend that you set one up for yourselves. Um, but we update it occasionally. Um, one of the great things about um, working in a studio with multiple engineers is we all work together. You know, we aren't in odds with each other. Like we literally are on a team, so we communicate all the time. And people are like, you know what? I find that I keep doing this. Or like, like for instance, like oh, you know, Travis's album just dropped, and man, there it's drowning the delays and verbs afterwards. We need to make sure that we have a send on this track to send into this. And so cool. So let's make sure we have our settings ready because people are going to be looking for that. Bam, we're ready to go. So in a session, we're just working faster. Okay. Um, people are like, hey, you know that thing from that one song? Yeah, I'm right there with you. Boom. You know. Um, and it doesn't. That's not demeaning to it. It's just. It's. It's just. This is. This is what workflow is. Is that it's not hampering my creativity or the artist's creativity. When they say they want to hear something, you get that instant gratification. That excites someone. That makes them want to perform better. Um, it's really, it's really important. Um, anyway, so yeah, so I come up and go to import. Um, you're going to see this box come up, and I literally just grab all the channels that I've set up and I just hit thunk, OK, and they all just drop right in. Um, once I have that in, I then go and I import the beat. Um, oh, actually, let me go up and I take this for granted. Um, so if you're using the mouse, um, you would come up and you would go import session data. You choose your file to import session data from. Okay. If you're using the mouse, you would go over to file, import 
audio. When we have interns, and they do what I just did, where I went up to the menu, and they click with that, they get their hand smacked, okay? How much time did that just take? And it just popped, okay? When you go up to the menus in Pro Tools, like, it's literally right there. Uh, because people just don't look and they see like four, three or four things and they just shut down. They're just like, ah. Like, seriously, session data? Alt Shift I. Like, if you're on, that's going to be, I think, the same on Mac. Um, we run PCs here. If you're on Mac, anywhere that says Control, put the, uh, the Apple key or Command key in. Just substitute Command key. It's basically in the same spot. Well, actually, no, it's where the Alt key is. And it kind of sucks when you go back and forth. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, use your keyboard shortcuts, okay? Like, this is the biggest thing. Like, you will waste so much time. Um, also, all shift on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So, I'm going to go up and I'm going to hit Control or Command Shift I um, to import audio. And so, let's say I'm going to go. Let's say I'm just going to go find a uh, beat. There we go. This young golf key, key clock type beat. Okay, cool. I'm a, okay, it's going to pop up and ask me where I want to import it to. I don't just hit use current folder. I look at this. I double check. Yes, that is the name of the session I'm working on. It says audio files. Use current folder. Do not let yourself become a zombie and just hit this. It maybe happens once a year. Uh, how many thousands of sessions that we run. But once a year, that isn't right. For whatever reason... I don't know, and honestly, I don't care because I'm going to look at it every time. You are responsible for the data that hits your system. Client doesn't care if, oh, the computer did something weird. Doesn't matter, bro. You lost my track. You're the asshole. So, um, so we're going to make sure that it's going to the right place. Okay. Hit use current folder, grabs it, processes it, and it's going to drop it. Um, uh, it's going to pop up and ask us. We're going to go to the clip list. The clip list is... Oh, that's a good track list. Clip list is over here, which you can't access right now because we're going to have a dialog up. But you're going to do new track. Um, you can do a session start. If it's at selection, wherever this cursor is, is where it's going to put the start of this beat. Um, so anyway, so we've got this beat here. So I pull that in. And in my template, we have a track that's literally just named instrumental. So let's say if this beat wasn't here... I'm just going to put it off to the side. We'll talk about playlists here in a sec. I would pull it down. I uh, will jump ahead to the drums, and the first thing you do is you find the tempo. We're at 55, so I come in and I take a look at it. It looks like we're on, but when working with instrumentals and things like that, you know what normally happens? Let's see why, like why is this not directly on that marker? It should be perfectly on there, why not? Let's go to the beginning of the file. Hey, look at that. Oh, wow. Um, little side note, you see how I'm zooming in this waveform here, just like woo, everything. Um, hold down Alt-Shift um, and use your mouse wheel, okay? I can literally zoom. This isn't making it louder or softer. This is just zooming it so I can see it better. Okay. So when I go in to the beginning of this right over here, I can zoom in and look at this. I can be like, oh, you know what? Right there. I mean, I could zoom in all the way down to the sample level if I wanted to and be like, oh, that's exactly where it started. Bam, right there. Move out and then slide it against the front. And let's go take a look at it again. Well, Actually, looks like we have a little bit, either the kick drum lags a little bit, or let's just put our grid down, let's look at all this. <coughs> yep, I'm going to move this up just a little bit more. So, 
One thing I want to point out to you, I want to kind of just move around a little bit. You guys notice the speed of which I'm zooming out, I'm looking at this, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, okay? Mm -hmm. You notice where my hands are the entire time. They're on the keyboard and the mouse, okay? If you're left-handed, cool. Over here, one hand on the mouse. Seriously, if you're using a mouse, get a trackball. Like, trackballs destroy mice. I'm not, I'm not doing this thing. I'm going to sit here right here. So I can have this thing crazy sensitive. I can be anywhere I want. It's incredibly accurate. You can use your fingertips to move around. Um, um, it also, it just, it, it, you don't get as much carpal tunnel. If you do this a lot, stuff like that. It just kind of more naturally fits in your hand the way your hand sits. Um, but then the other thing is then my other hand is on the keyboard. And uh, if anybody can see, my hand is on the home keys. ADSF. If you ever took a typing class, um, even if you haven't, you know the keyboards have those two little bumps? These four fingers right here should be on these right here. If you're left-handed, you can put your right hand there if you really need to. But that's about where you're going to want to be, okay? And there's a really important reason for this. And this is another one of the biggest things I see sessions that come in are missing. Um, there's this <laughs> one simple trick for Pro Tools. Um, Right here, this little box up there, if that's an A and a Z, it's really hard to see. It kind of looks like two white squares and two black squares, like a checkered flag, but that's actually an A there and a Z there. That should be lit up gold, orange, whatever <clears throat> color it looks on your screen, okay? When that's on, my keyboard like becomes the best tool ever. I, it's what we call one-touch keyboard shortcuts, okay? So, if I want to zoom in on this, okay, if I don't have this on, how do, um, actually, I, like, actually, how do I do this? Um, I think I grab this and I highlight that. Okay, there we go. Um, and then, oh, but I want to, I want to, I want to zoom back out, um, like, that's the waveform. Um, oh, there it is, yeah. You can click and drag that. That's right. Oh, you can also do the waveform. Okay, that's how much I don't use these. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's in Pro Tools. That's cute. That's really yeah. cute. Um... <laughs> So, um, like that, like that is so cumbersome. Like your mouse and keyboard should work together. It's like it's a, it's a, it's a dance. You know, um, they complement each other. The mouse should not be doing what the keyboard does. Okay. So when I have that on, that same thing. If I hit T, I zoom in. Oh, I hit R and I can hold it. I zoom in and out. Now there's a second functionality of this too. Is let's say I want to get over. I want to center my view over there. I hit T, it just zoomed in one level, but it just centered that in my view. So I just moved my view bah, bah, back and forth real quick. And like, you notice one other thing you haven't seen me do? If you're grabbing these bars, like, wow, welcome to 1996. <laughs> um, get your Netscape browser and, oh. Um, yeah, see who actually got that. Most of you probably don't know what Netscape is. Um, um, so. Here's, here's another thing that you're able to do, and I think a lot of people miss this, is once again, using the mouse wheel. So under underutilized by a lot of people. We all know that we can mouse wheel up and down. That's cool. Um, but if I hold shift, oh, I'm going left to right. So I'm like up, down, left, right, side to side. Um, so like all of a sudden, I'm getting around this session. I'm just like, bam, I want that up, down, you know, look at this. Oh, hang on, what's what's happening right there? Oh, yeah, I heard that thing. Oh, yeah, there's a little bit of noise right there, so let me kick that out. If you hit F, you're able to just put in fades. And then you can grab them, you can go up and down, you can double click if you want to have a really cool looking fade. You know, remember that thing from earlier we were looking at? And you can do S curves and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, um, but let's say I did all of that, and I'm like, oh, that sucks. Let me go up, undo, uh, wait, hang on, control Z. I can hit control Z, okay, just like anything else. That's cool. But you know what? I had to move my hand away to hit control and Z, two letters at the same time. I have one touch keyboard shortcuts on. You know what? I literally just hit the Z key. <laughs> and it undoes it, <laughs> okay? Um, so, yeah, like one touch keyboard shortcuts, a number of sessions that come in, and like I import, and I get their settings, and I'm like hitting the keyboard and I'm just like, what's happening? Nothing's happening. Like what's broken? And I'm just like, oh, that's on. Because I, I literally go for months at a time without even thinking about it. Like it's it should be that much a part of your workflow. How'd you do the playlist so fast? Oh, um, <laughs> okay. Um, so, all right, well, we'll I, will, I will get, I will get okay. there. But we're going to talk about first what a playlist is. Um, so um, when we come over here, we can look. Like here's a track of audio. We can look at our track a lot of different ways. Okay.
Okay. Um, I can look at blocks, I guess, if you're into that, um, if you like guessing. Um, we have waveform, which is the default. We actually see the, uh, you know, what the what the sound is, what it looks like, the oscillations. We can look at volume. You know, that's where we can like grab stuff and like move stuff up and down. And, um, and then we have um, we can just mute sections. You know, where if we're playing. Not super useful for audio tracks because you can just edit it. Very useful for plugins that make noise, like tape machines or some like a lot of UA plugs. Um, some Stephen Slate plugins generate noise, um, which a lot of people have complained about. Actually, newest update is of Slate stuff, if you use it, doesn't have as much noise in it, or you can shut it off completely, which is nice. Um, but um, all right, so you can control the pans, all of that stuff. So these are our automation lanes. The other thing that we can do here is we can also look at our playlists. Okay, so a playlist is a place that I can just keep audio around. Okay, like keep a waveform that I can quickly access. Okay, so not super useful for beats. It can be like in this case because I brought in a different beat and I didn't want to put it over this one and lose it. Um, so like I can pull this one down and then put this beat back. See, the one that's on the top is going to play. Okay. Um, unless you see that I have down here, I can come in and I can double click and I can rename what this is. I can call this like Alt B because I don't know, I'm going to remix the two or something. Um, um, I can solo this track. But as soon as I unsolo that, we're back to that. Um, beats, not super useful. Vocals. Vocal type. Oh, jeez, yeah. Okay, so I can totally come over to this and I can go playlist and I can see, oh, hey, look at this. There's like this audio that's like, it's like it's behind and just kind of got folded down. Um, the way that you quickly get through this menu, by the way, is you're going to hit Control Alt, so Command Alt, and you're going to hit the. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you're going to hit Windows Control, which I think is Command Control um, on Mac. Um, and you're going to hit the left left and right keys to go through the different envelopes quickly for that track. Okay. So when I have it up, I just go, bam, I hit, once again, Control, um, control Windows, um, or Command Control is what I think it is. Um, and it's just, I hit left and it just opens up my playlist, okay? So when I'm tracking, unless something was just like, like you're just like, there's no way this would ever be usable, um, you just you, you just playlist, you are a pack rat. It's on your hard drive. You're not deleting it off there. You might as well keep it usable. So typically when recording, so let's see, we can look at this, that was take five. Um, here's take, um, let's look at this, take one. I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? Okay. So this um, this guy actually pretty pretty good vocalist, um, really good consistent tone. Um, as I listen to that, my critique is I hear the first part of it, I feel like he's a little pitchy. Yeah, we can go in and edit and auto tune and stuff like that, but I want to keep him natural. So let's see if I have something else in here. Um, and actually, this this is not the July release of Pro Tools. Um, in the July release of Pro Tools, what I'm doing right here are actually workflow enhancements to playlists that actually make what I'm getting ready to do easier, but mm. the, the ideas apply, but if you get the newest version, definitely read a tutorial on it. I'm really excited to uh, to start using it. This is the April release still, just because it literally came out like a week ago. Um, and that's, that's, that's not enough time for us to guarantee that it's stable under the load that we need to run Pro Tools. So, you know, um, let other people guinea pig it first. So, all right, so let's say I want to listen to this right here. Um, I want to, I'm going to put myself in loop mode, which you can do if you use the number pad by hitting four on the number pad. Um, so I can toggle between regular playback where it'll just stop or it'll loop, which is really cool. Um, coincidentally, um, five on the number pad puts you in loop record is which is fun i'm um, not super duper useful for regular session flow but sometimes um and then six is what you should always be in we'll talk about that here in a minute which is quick punch you should always be in quick punch um 
Um, if you're not in quick punch, you're going to lose takes. Um, and you're going to lose takes when the artist is doing something that they just thought that it was a playback and it was a playback, but you're like, holy shit, that's really cool. And you're able to grab the whole take. Um, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, but we've already recorded a bunch of times, so I'm like, eh, let me put this. So I'm going to put myself in grid mode and I'm just going to listen to, I'm going to highlight these two bars here. Notice how I did that really quickly from, uh, and I got it like perfectly on the grid. These four up here are modes of how um, you work with audio and Pro Tools. You have shuffle, spot, slip, and grid. Slip and grid are going to be the two big ones that you're going to use. Slip means you can, I can put this cursor wherever the hell I want. I do whatever I want with it. Okay. Um, grid means I'm going to be locked to the grid. Okay. Up here is where you define what your grid is. Um, when you're working on music, you should be working in measures or bars and beats. Um, if I went to minutes and seconds, I could zoom in and I could use this by grid by second. That's not super useful for listening to music. Um, we want to keep it in bars and beats. So I'm going to put it back. Right now we're in eighth notes. Um, so it's more subdivided. Um, I can also just go up to bars, but when I'm in grid mode, notice I can't select anywhere but at those grid markers. So I can go up and adjust my grid here. Okay. Um, one of those things also I think about. And I'm just like, where's the shortcut? Um, um, all right, so I'm going to highlight this. We're in loop playback. I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? We're going to listen to a different take now, um, just for people on the webcam because you can't hear me when it's playing back. We're going to solo through these different takes and we can just hear them back to back. I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? Kind of is interesting take. It looks like we did a little bit of editing and tried to fix something. I've been wondering, wondering, will the money... That's kind of nice. I like I like the way he's pronouncing some of the words. It's a little bit more dramatic, but we don't have as much chest tone. It's a little bit more nasal. But I'm like, okay, so you know, so that track right there, I kind of like blue, blue. I kind of like. Let's uh, let's keep listening to it in context. I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? So, I don't know. See, that's that's tough. So I can take this here, and I'm like, man, I really like that. Whatever I have selected, I can hit this right here, and it promotes it uh -huh. up to the top. Okay. So where this is useful is, let's say I go back and I listen to. This. I've been wondering, wondering. Will Let's say I was just like, man, I love everything about this except the wonderings. So, oh, uh, other thing, um, the way that I'm just quickly slicing that real quick, the B key. Just hit the B key on the keyboard. So yeah, I hit B, thunk, it just made it its own clip, okay? Um, I can do that as well if I select, let's say, down my playlist here, and I can just hit that, they all just cut, and so then I can be like, okay, hey, so this one's pretty good, let me just promote that up. I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come? Okay. And I was just like, oh, okay, you know, I need to clean up some of the edges and stuff like that, but all of a sudden that sounds a lot better. Um, and I can be like, oh, you know, I don't like that. Hit the Z key, it's back down. Uh, let's check this one. I've been wondering, I've been wondering, wondering, will the money Here's slight difference in timing. Once again, we can work that out if we really need to, but um, I'm going to go back. Honestly, I think this is probably... Um, like at least this section here, I just liked all of that better, so let's put that up. I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? Okay. Actually, I really like that way, that the way that he did that. Um, let's listen to some of these other ones. I like the one that's up here. Um, so when I've put slices in stuff unnecessarily and I want to, and it's the same take, there's a couple ways that I can make this nice and pretty again. I can just grab one of the ends and just drag it out, um, which is which is kind of cool. Um, the other thing I can do, so I'm hitting the Z key to go back, I can just highlight all of this. If I hit Control H, it heals. Hence H for heal. Um, okay, 
So let's zoom in and let's actually take a look at these edges. Once again, I'm like, man, that's really small. What am I going to do? I'm going to hold Alt Shift. I'm going to use the mouse wheel. And I'm going to zoom in and look at this. Um, actually, that's uh, this is actually a really bad example because that's actually perfectly lined up. Um, I don't need to put a fade on that. Um, <laughs> for shits and grins, I'm going to put a really small fade on that. Uh, actually, no, I'm not going to because that, that's not a good way for me. Um, that is like a perfect... <laughs> yeah. um, so whenever you, you, know, you hear audio and you hear these clicks and pops at your edits, it's because you didn't put fades on them. And what you're actually hearing is you're hearing, it's called a, a discontinuity. That's just a big word for shit doesn't line up. Okay? Um, so for instance, if I just grab, let's say, just some random piece of audio, moved it up, and then came in and took a look at it. Okay, so here we go. That's really close. But it's not actually, like, if it was right here, eh, it's kind of getting there. They're in the ballpark because he actually, he's, once again, I'd say this vocalist is incredibly consistent. Like, this is, you're going to be hard-pressed to find an everyday vocalist that is this consistent. Like, this guy is, like, studying music, like, really, really good. Um, but you're probably going to hear some sort of click or pop. I've been wondering why. I've been wondering why. Uh, also, you hear that, you also hear the difference in level. Yeah. Um, which, when you hear volume change difference, you have these little, uh, this little thing where it says, yep, you got your clip gain. Let me just, um, you can also, if you want to, if you're doing like a lot actually in ADR, um, in ADR and stuff like that, you can actually set up where you just have your volume bars. You have a bar for each clip that's in the middle that you can use to quickly clip gain up and down. I don't like doing that. It's an extra visual distraction, but I can see if you're really having to really hack together a spoken word passage, that would be really useful. If you're going like syllable for syllable. I like getting enough takes that I never have to go syllable for syllable. Um, I like to, it's, it's always sounds best if you can comp phrases and sections rather than individual words. Sometimes you have to. Sometimes someone didn't put an S or a T on the end of a phrase and you have to cut it and move it and get it in another spot. Um, all right, so, um, all right, so, okay, so we got this. So that was one phrase. <laughs> I've been grinding, grinding every single day. So, I mean, honestly, at this point, I, I think actually the take that we ended up going for on this was this one. I'm just, you can also just drag them up. I've been grinding, grinding every single day. So, okay, so let's say we've comped together and we've put together the perfect vocal. Um, now, part of the question that you, and the part of the conversation that you need to have when you're working with an artist or on a project is what's your end goal, okay? So, like, I just spent all this time doing this. Do you want to do that as part of the mixing process or, like, the editing process before you really mix it? Me, personally, I do this with the artist. Typically, the artist hasn't stepped out of the booth until we've comped it together and we've listened back to it and we're both like, yeah, we think we're going to go with that. Then you come out and you do some more work and then you listen to it again. You listen to the whole song and see if anything jumps out at you. Because sometimes when you're comping, like you're so close to it, that you're like, oh, that sounds great. And then you listen to it in the flow of the song and you're like, oh my God, that's horrendous. That sounds like nothing else. So, you know, or it sounds unnatural. You have to be able to step back and get the big picture sometimes. Okay. So it's nice to be doing the quick loop edits, but always step back after a few minutes and just listen from beginning to end. Okay? Um, because that you need the perspective to make good decisions. Um, and if you decide that you made bad decisions, take your ego out of it and be like, yep, that wasn't good. Go back to the drawing board. Okay. Don't, don't double down on mistakes or bad decisions. Okay. Um, so be, be honest with yourself. <laughs> um, okay. So let's talk about actually recording here. Okay. We want to be in quick punch mode. Um, anybody know how I quickly get the transport up right here? Uh, control one or command one. Yep, yeah, absolutely. You hit that and this pops up here. Um, um, and so when you see that P right there, that stands for quick punch. So here's the cool thing about quick punch. Um, and I'm going to kind of talk about this holistically of the way that I like to record. Okay. I don't like to record people on the tracks that the audio actually ends up on. Okay. I like to have what I call my tracking channel. I color it its own color, um, and then let's say, you know, um, the artist name, Amar. Uh, so I take that and then I pull it down to here. If while he was recording, I was adjusting some EQ and settings on him, I literally just grab this and I just thunk, 
drop it down here. So even if it's different people and I need to readjust my, my EQ or, or compression or whatever I have going, which as an aside, if you're having to adjust a ton of that when you're recording someone, they're not on the mic. They're on the mic or they're not, or they're not a great performer, which means you need to you need to be having other thoughts or conversations with the artist. But I understand sometimes you just kind of have to go with what you go with. But if you find every time somebody gets on the mic, you're, you're doing this move, that means they're not looking at the mic. Um, or you set the mic for them, and then they look down at the phone, and now you're micing their forehead. You know, and you're like, why does everything sound so dark and muddy? You know? So um, those, those things are indicators. If you find yourself immediately reaching for EQ anytime someone hops on a mic, you're not using the mic right. Just you know. Um, anyways, um, I digress. So, um, so when recording, um, what I normally do is I record on. You have to hit this so Pro Tools knows what channel to record. I'm assuming that on your setups, you already know what input you're plugged into and all of that stuff. Um, I don't... It, don't route to buses. Never route your tracking channel through any other auxiliary bus or anything like that. Delay compensation, the way Pro Tools works, you are playing with fire. All of a sudden, they'll be fine one take, and next take, someone will be like, hey, like, why is this echo in my headphones? So, um, which actually brings me, uh, I'll get to that here in a second, so the interface. Um, all right, so I like to do that, but then there's another letter right here, and it showed up just in the more recent version of the Pro Tools. If you're using HD systems, back in the day, which is where we started, we always had this. But this only came into like regular Pro Tools recently, and that is input monitor. And this is really awesome. If you're working with an artist and recording them, and you're like, hey, let's listen back to that. And you're playing back, and they're like, whoa, that sucked, oh, that was amazing. And like before that, they would just be like, I'm like, I have to stop playback. What, what was that? Oh, that part right there. Oh shit, where were we at? Where were we at in the playback? We're listening to the whole song. and. Or, oh, I just had this idea right here. So I want to have this input monitor. So that means even during playback, it's always open, okay? Now, what that means, though, is that if I play and I left the audio here, I'm doing, I'm doing this move, actually. Um, and pull it down. Like actually a lot of times what I, like little <laughs> pro tip here, is I pull stuff down to the playlist, I put my tracking channel underneath my main channel, that way it's just a real short, just boom. Um, and typically I just kind of by default put myself in grid mode, um, relative grid, um, but um, in grid mode just to make sure that I don't accidentally move the audio. But it kind of, it's a little sticky, so even if I'm in slip mode, as long as I don't like move it like too far, if I just go up, it kind of just sticks. Um, if I go up and kind of off, you see, even then it moved a little bit and then it's stuck and I have to kind of break it. But after, once it's broken, I'm just like, oh shit, this is screwed up. So yeah, yep. hit your Z key. <laughs> like even when doing this, you see me making mistakes as I'm moving stuff. I'm just like, whatever, Z redo, Z redo. Um, um, make mistakes boldly. Um, so, so I have this right here. I can't hear it. And will the money come my way? Okay, now I can hear it. But now we're listening back. I've been grinding, grinding every single day. I don't like how I said grinding right there. You know, I can hear him. And while we're playing back, I'm like, oh, okay. I've been grinding, grinding every single day. My workflow, when there's something I need to remember, especially in a long workflow, I like to highlight it, separate the clip. So I highlight, hit B. And then I hit Control M, Command M. What that does is it mutes the clip. That that clip is not going to play. It didn't do anything to the track. It just literally muted. I've been grinding every single day. And I know that I either need to go down to my playlist and find a better version of that, that phrase, or if we don't have one, you're on the mic. We got to hit that again. Okay. Um, be aggressive in getting good takes early. Um, if you're aggressive in getting good takes, you will be a better mixing engineer every time, okay? Um, the better, the better material you have to work with, the better your end product is going to be. Um, good artists make me seem like an amazing engineer because I basically don't do anything, okay? The less I have to do as an engineer, the better. 
doesn't matter if I have this cool new plugin or this new processing idea that I want to try out. If it's a good R, I'm just like, if it's good, it's good. It sounds good. It is good. Don't mess with it. Okay. Um, worst thing you can do is overprocess something and do harm. So anyway, so I like marking stuff that we need to like take a look at. And you know, just grab that and just think. Um, there's another really cool way of um, of kind of helping edit your audio. Control H to do that. Um, that I, I'm, once again, I'm just floored at seeing people not use this. Um, is um, this little button right here, tab to transients. Okay. First of all, what's a transient? Any place that the audio goes from like low, low, uh, low amplitude, in other words, low volume, to high volume, high amplitude. So, like, you know, for instance, let's look at let's look at this beat up here. I'm on grid, so I know that I can go in here and put a slice there. And it's going to be pretty good. If I wasn't though, I have my cursor here, and I hit the tab key on the keyboard. Whoa, let's zoom in and look at that. It nailed it. Okay, that's tab to transients. If I hit it again, it hops over. On base, it may find kind of extraneous things, but you look at that and you're like, oh, hey, so what's there? Ah, it was a snare. So like, if you want to remix stuff, slice up a beat, like really freak some stuff, like, man, you're just like right on it, you know? So. Now I could totally, you know, hit that, hit B. Um, let's not put one there. Let's put one there, one there, one there. Um, so, um, by the way, you can adjust the grid quickly. Sometimes on these shortcut keys, by the way, I have to actually do it without thinking. Um, if you hold down uh, Windows and Alt, I'm not sure what that translates to on Mac, um, but and you use the plus and minus on the number cat pad, notice what I'm doing? I'm changing the grid the resolution of the grid without actually touching anything. So um, without actually having to go up with the mouse. Once again, keyboard shortcuts. So, um, so I can grab that and then I can be like, oh, you know what, I wanna put that You know, and then uh, let's go up to our audio suite and let's do, I don't know, verify. how would that sound? And you verify it, uh, reverse it, I don't know. You know, I can go into smaller resolution and be like, oh, you know, let's do that cool, like, little stuttering. Um, so, um, Anyways, and Z, and it's all put back together, okay? Um, so tab to transients, really, really useful, okay? Um, things in workflow. Um, that happen. Okay, any any questions about playlist tracking, record, record input monitoring? Any Anybody have any questions, any things to add, any things that they do that they think are cool? So it's always best to get the best vocals as you can possible versus getting some shitty and having like work with yeah fix in the mix unfortunately happens but if that should never be your goal if you've got the time i would i would rather someone spends time recording um art most artists like the, the artists at the top at the top of their game that everyone aspires to be do not record songs in an hour okay um you spend eight hours recording a song yeah, that's pretty much done. It's immaculate. I don't what, need to edit that. Why do you spend eight hours recording a song? What takes eight hours? Making, a, making every syllable, the inflection, the pitch, everything perfect. It's so what do you find is the preference with artists you've worked with in terms of like um, wanting to just do it all at once and have that be the intention of it rather than like... Well, it, it depends. It depends on... It really depends on what the... Um, what the artist's value scale is and what they're and what they're trying to do with their product. Once again, when I say this, I'm not I'm not talking down to someone that comes in. People will come in and be like, cool, two hours, we're gonna knock out two tracks. Like, bam, start to finish, let's do this. Absolutely. Um, if you're putting out something that you're wanting to be competing on like a Kendrick J. Cole level, mm -hmm. yeah, you're gonna spend a lot of time recording your stuff. Um, so what's the difference between someone like a Jay-Z say goes in and does it in one take and he's famous for that? 
Like Gutler. You see in documentaries yeah. him messing yeah. up. Yeah, he knows his part. And, it's well, not one and they learn it and then they run it and they run it. And then Rick Rubin's like, okay, that was cool. Let's do it again. You know? You know, I use two punch, though. They do a lot of punching. Yeah. It's like a gimmick. Yeah. Um, oh, that's right. It actually, cool, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. No, actually, that's, that's I got sorry. I got sidetracked by some stuff. So going back to Quick Punch. Yeah, oh, yeah Quick Punch is where I apologize for that. Um, so what Quick Punch allows me to do is that any time that I hit, play, if you get people on there, every time I hit play, it's actually always recording underneath the hood. So check this out. Okay, so I hit the three key on the number pad to punch in. Okay, I think we're all familiar with that. And so you're like, oh, I punched in at these two points. Uh uh. -uh. It actually was recording that entire time. Okay, so let's say you punched in a second late or something like that. You didn't lose it, it's there. Just pull the clip back, and there's the audio. Okay, it will save your ass non stop. Okay, personally, I also like recording this way because. I don't want an artist when I'm punching in, I don't want them to just come in on just that word or that phrase. I need them to kind of hit a running start most of the time, especially if we're trying to fix an individual piece, because otherwise it's gonna sound like a totally different phrasing performance. Even just going through the playlist can sometimes be tough, because you heard even though he's really consistent, his tone was a little different. Maybe he was slightly on the mic differently. Maybe he like tilted his head back a little bit on one. That changes his tone. Um, but if he sings into it from earlier, it gives me more places to splice the take to actually fix the part that we need. It's so like a lot of times, if let's say I needed to fix this, like there's this one spot, I may end up using this whole other phrase just because that's where it sounds the most natural. Oh, oh, oh just okay, gotcha. Um, so you should always be working in quick punch. Okay. One question about the playlist: How do I add another take to it? Uh, you're talking about when working in the playlist? Yes. Oh, good question. If you look in your playlist, like you have all of these here, the way that I create another one, you see this cool little track down here at the bottom? I can't actually select on it. It's like this almost like mini, like secondary little track down here. I just, okay. bam, and it turns into a new one. Cool. Okay. Um, so, um, but yeah, quick, quick punch is how you should work. And so I like this because the artist is able to hear themselves on the previous one and they can start matching their tone inflection singing along. And so a lot of times what I'll do, I'll be like, oh, like I needed to get you in on this part. And so I'll play it from back here. I'll be like, cool, I'm gonna get a couple bars in, come on in. I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? I've been grinding, grinding. And hopefully then he, he's singing by there and then he's by himself so he can just hear himself and focus. Um, but that way, but he's sung into it the whole way because when you do a performance, your vocal cords are working, your instrument's working. You can't just start from a dead stop. You know, you aren't, you're not a sprinter. Even sprinters take a little bit to get up to speed. You know, as they stand up. So, anyway, so definitely quick punches. How you should be uh, is how you should be working on that side. How many how many bars do you usually have the artist come in? Almost always two. Two Almost bars, always two bars. Right, mm -hmm. There's some people. Once again, you just kind of follow follow the artist's comfort yeah. level. Um, I've dev I've worked with some artists that are like, no, seriously, give me just like a second or two before. And I'm like, I, I couldn't personally do that, but but if they do it and it works, awesome. Um, but normally two bars is enough to, to establish the tempo and feel um, and uh, and get a good solid matching performance. Um, so, uh, okay, last thing that I wanna like really make sure that we look at just in terms of just general Pro Tools stuff because right now we've kind of got through like main recording and making sure that you're getting your takes, your playlists, all of that stuff. Um, all the stuff of like mixing and buses and mastering and making stuff loud and all that stuff. But seriously, that's all. Those are all deep dives on them, you know, in and of themselves. And I really just want to hit mainly just Pro Tools today, making sure we're all working the right way. Is you have your session. So the name of this session is Money Man. So it created a folder when I created my session, and. It created an audio files folder, bounce files folder, clip groups, session file backups, video files. Okay. Where every time I hit record, 
that wave file that was created because remember when we created a session we told it to create wave files it is in here in the audio files folder if you open up a session and it is missing a clip like you have something that's white you go to this folder and look at the name and see if that files here I guarantee you it's not or the session is super corrupted but it this is where it should be and this is where it's looking for the audio files okay this is why it is so important that when you go to import your audio when you're importing your beats you hit copy files not add file if I hit add files the files gonna stay where it's at no because when you move that session or send it to someplace else or something like that they will not have those files you hit copy files and remember and where does it come up and ask Bam, audio files use folder that's where it should be every single time okay um, cool so so you should be able to go into your um, this session out of yeah, just arranging the playground. Um, so you should be able to go into audio files and find every single take. And if I go here to date modified, I should be able to see the timestamp. You can see though I imported this beat today at 10:52. I hit recording and it gets named tracking because that's the tracking channel. Label your files. Um, so, um, all right. So we've got we've got about 30 minutes left. So at this point, I want to just kind of open up and actually start, like, let you all ask specific questions. These are my big things for getting a Pro Tools set up and being able to record an artist efficiently and consistently. Session to session, doesn't matter what it is, work this way. Work this way and you're going to find that your workflow is just really smooth. Um, if you are, you can start running heavier processing when you pull your audio up to another channel. Stuff that incurs latency. Okay, when you're listening back from another channel um, so so that's why you basically keep your audio when you're listening back off the channel that you aren't tracking on so the tracking is just for communication with you and the artist okay um, so so what are what are let's just open up Pro Tools questions everybody online what are we issues tech issues what if what have we what have we run into what are things we still want to know and kind of dive into Beat Detective, my recommendation on Beat Detective, don't use it. <laughs> it's really old. It's really old. Um, your tab to transient and being able to tap tempo is really powerful. If you have something that's not sticking to grid, we want to use Elastic Audio and lock it to a standard grid. That's the only, that'll be like the last thing I do. If, like if it's a weird number, the tempo. I, that, but it always will give me like a number that's like way yeah, off. So yeah, like, I... Yeah, Beat Detective was cool, but like seriously, Beat Detective has been around in Pro Tools since actually, actually it's always been there. I started using Pro Tools in version, I think the very first one I got with my 002 rack back in the day was 5.6, 5.8, um, and I think even Beat Detective was in that then. So um, yeah, so it's really old. They haven't updated. I don't even know why it's here anymore. Um, but Elastic Audio is what I would is what I would rec yeah, yes. recommend. Um, let's see, I don't really want to get into Elastic Audio unless we really have a great need to talk about it right now. But um, Elastic Audio is normally like that's fixing stuff and stuff's gone very wrong. Um, questions? Your CPU load, is mm -hmm. your plugins aren't being active until it touches away from it on this specific post? Yes, yes, absolutely. By default, actually up in the preferences, right. um, the um, our plugins, um, um, AAX plugins, which is part of the reason to get on more modern Pro Tools, so you're not using RTOS, yep. um, um, is they is they shut themselves down after a period of time. They don't shut themselves down immediately, but after um, I I don't know, you can run tests and probably figure it out. They shut themselves off, so you get that CPU power back. Um, to kind of further illustrate that point, um, what I recommend that you do if you're working in a large session, let's say I have this tracked out beat make this active here real quick um, is what I recommend that you do is you go through and I'm gonna bring up strip silence which menu. yeah there is that's why I'm looking in the menu I'm like I think it's in the edit menu control U so command U you hit that and what this is is it's kinda like a gate 
where I can yeah. set the threshold and then it can give stuff padding. But actually, I'll normally go in and just strip silence the beat. Um, just be careful with any synths, strings, claps, things with reverb tails. Um, that, uh, that you don't cut them off, right? So sometimes if you're doing that, just give yourself a bit of an end padding. Um, once again, play around with this. You'll kind of figure it out. It's not, it's not too difficult. But that enables you to just quickly like edit that. Um, so like I can grab this and then throw out this dead time. And because of that, in between on this section here, the, any plugin that I'm running on this is going to shut itself down so I get that CPU power back. Um, um, actually, just while we're talking about it, one other thing that I will mention just on CPU power is, um, is you do have a big trade-off between CPU power and the buffer of your audio interface, okay? Now, if we're all familiar with, you know, we have our audio interface and we have to set a buffer, okay? That is, so like we use the Universal Audio Apollos, okay? Um, the buffer is how many samples, and we can equate that to time, um, how long it needs to kind of build up a reservoir of data before it lets stuff flow through it, okay? And that's just because computers, as much as they try to be super consistent, they aren't always super consistent, okay? So if you're recording, um, I don't recommend setting your interface to anything higher than 64. Um, even some artists still detect a weird amount of latency at 64 samples. Um, you can go as low. Um, the lower that you go, the more CPU that you're going to use. And it goes up exponentially. So that's not like just doubling. Like, it goes way up, way high, okay? But that's important to um, a mix to the artist that they hear themselves in the headphone and it feels like it's real time so they can actually perform properly, okay? Um, so we typically run at 64. Um, um, one of the things that we really like um, Neutron 2 is that it has a zero latency mode, um, which means this plugin is incurring no latency. It's real time. Um, but when I turn this off, um, the quality of all of the processors actually increases a little bit. It gets a little smoother, a little richer, um, which is really nice. Um, but there's some amount of latency, depending on which modules I have turned on, which can make the vocal sound like it's way behind. So you pop it in zero latency, I have to change any of my actual settings, and it's just and it's just ready to go. So I can record through it. And so this is this is my compressor, this is my EQ, stuff like that. Um, so um, you do track with some process. Oh, absolutely. Okay. If you you need to be tracking with a compressor. Um, I recommend I recommend going software because you can always take it back. Um, hardware compressors are great, but you better be on your game. You better you better really know what you're doing with it because if that could be the best take ever, and if you jacked it up, you got to work with it. You know. Um, so, um, anyways, so you, you do use more CPU. Um, you'll notice that you see like right now we're hovering around like 30% total, and you kind of see it moving back and forth. If I shut that off and give it a second, everything kind of evens out a bit more. Um, the machines that we use in here are really powerful, um, so um, we can we can run a lot. And actually, a lot of times we actually run entire sessions, including mixing at 64 sample buffers, without an issue. Um, if you're running, if you aren't running like it, shoot, at least a quad, if not a six core machine, you're probably going to want to change your buffer and kick it up a thousand twenty four. Whenever you go to actually mixing and doing and doing your work. If you've ever been working and you hear those clicks and pops, that means you need to increase your buffer. Okay? Um, um, In terms go, of hardware, too, right? I'm sorry? In terms of hardware. Though. Yeah. So some interfaces will actually allow you to change it. Um, I don't know if you all saw that. I went up to Setup, Playback Engine. Um, and so you can, some interfaces allow you to change it right here. The Universal Audio Apollos, we have to use their setting, but you'll see if I take this and change the
take, you know, I can take this processor and I can render of it. So then I can't edit anything, but like all this is frozen and it's here. Um, anyways, um, so I can do that and then I can unfreeze it and now it's going to process in real time again, but then I can refreeze it. So you can do all of these things in order to work really fast um, if you're running out of CPU power. Actually, is that something that people have issues with, that they come up against how much CPU power they have? Yeah, yeah. I'm running isotope. Okay, um, when, you're, when you're running stuff like this, and you're hearing clicks and pops, and you're trying to like put in more tracks. If you're running auto-tunes in real time, like that, that stuff uses a ton of CPU power. Um, okay, yeah, let's just kind of talk about that real quick. Um, in current versions of Pro Tools, um, there's a lot of different things you can do. Track freeze, there's a little snowflake right here. That's really useful. That's what freezes the track. Um, when I freeze the track, it prints it. When I say print, it means it renders it. So all of a sudden, you saw this waveform change, right? This is actually the resultant output of that neutron right there. Okay. Um, turn off this bit. Just mute that off right now. Okay. Um, I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come? So this isn't processing anymore, which is great. So if I unfreeze this, it goes back and you can see that's the original waveform. So you can see like what the compressor is doing and how evened out it is. And um, um, anyway, so it's also kind of cool because you normally don't get to see the final output of your waveform. So it's kind of cool that you get to see that. Um, other other things that you can do is let's say let's say I was let's say I was running auto tune on him. Um, I don't remember what key. That I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? I've been wondering. I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? Yeah, we're in B minor. Um, okay. So let's say I pull this up and and let's say like I've got let's say I've got a big ass R and B session and like I'm just like, man, the auto tune sounds great, but it's just killing my CPU. What I can do is, but I still need to be able to mix and have access to my EQs and things like that. I can come up, I can right click on a plugin, and I can hit freeze up to this insert, okay? It does that freeze functionality, but only up to that plugin. So now the auto tune is printed, but my neutron here, which is my EQ and compression, I can still move around, okay? But I just freed up the CPU that that auto tune is using. And once again, this isn't like permanent. So if I'm like, oh, you know what? I don't like that auto tune anymore. I can just unfreeze and we're back. At okay. any time? Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so you can gain so much CPU by doing that. Okay. That, um, that being said, in terms of good workflow practices, if you have time, auto tune, or once again, waves tune and any of that stuff. We actually just use auto tune for real time. Actually, we actually use waves tune for hand tuning and pitch correction. Um, those should always be printed. Always, 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 always print your tuning. Just because Auto-Tune has detected that pitch as the right note and sounds that way a hundred times, doesn't mean that the hundred and first time when you're rendering the track, it decides to freak the hell out on you or chipmunks or does something weird. And then I'm getting a call from the client who's driving home, jamming their car, and they're like, man, what the hell did you do to my hook? You know, that's not okay. So if I can print it, I'm gonna print it early as soon as I can and so that's part of editing really before mixing is you want to take care of that stuff um, so a lot of times what I do is actually because um, you uh, you've seen me use freeze now there's another thing we can do and that is I can commit um, so if I commit it's actually going to do like a for real print okay so I want to commit this track maybe I'll leave all this stuff here um, this main track, I can have it hide it, make it inactive, put it completely off to the side. For this right now, I'm just going to tell it to make it inactive. So watch this. So what's going to happen is it's going to create me a new track. So you notice that that auto tune isn't there and those other disabled plugins aren't there. But apart from that, it's identical. Here's the original. And here I get hookamar.cm standing for commit. I always really like seeing the CMs on everything because those are my initials. <laughs> Chris Masick, so every time I'm like, yeah. um, You can always hide the top one too, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you can go to hide and make an active. Typically, um, if, I'm, if I'm still in the editing process before I'm like really hardcore into mixing, 
I normally like leaving the tuned tracks right next to them just because sometimes I start mixing and I'm just like, oh, you know what? That one note or that one phrase just isn't hitting right. And what I literally do then is I'm just like, oh, you know, or like an S got smeary because of the tuning. I just. Every single, every single. What do you do with your S's as far as uh, controlling? Do you EQ them out, compress it, or do you use a DS or And if so, do you use uh, multiple DS's to uh, prevent like dynamic loss and dynamic loss? It, it. Yes. <laughs> I mean, um, I mean the, the thing is, is if it does, if I have to turn a knob backwards, you know, and it sounds good, awesome. Um, let's say there's a thousand different ways to, to make it happen. Um, the number one solver of S's and sibilants is a good performance and someone that's on a mic. Okay. Some mics may, um, may just, you know, distort. Um, S's or things like that, and that's another issue, then you need to look at a different mic. But um, especially cheaper mics in the sub thousand dollar range, you're going to find a lot of distortion on S's. Um, typically, um, you know, we talk about DSing. Um, you know, where most of the DSing is happening in here is I've got, uh, once again, there's a lot there. There's actually a lot that's going on just even in here. But I've got a band that actually is riding. The top and a lot of people think of the S's is just here. S has multiple ranges to it. Okay, so um, normally you try to be as white glove as possible. Okay, but um, yeah, I mean I can totally come in and you know I can put on a um, you know DSer. One of one of my uh, favorite DSers that I've been geeking on for a while actually is the RX DSer. Um, you can use it in a traditional way. You can use it as spectral smoothing and shaping and things like that, which is really cool. Um, um, another really good one is the um, EOSIS um, E2DS. This one's a little bit more complicated to get into because it's kind of like actually more like two EQs. And so you have one EQ that's, in, that's engaged when S'ing isn't happening and then a second EQ that engages. So if you have a really bad uh, lisp, you I've been wondering, wondering, will the money come my way? Yeah, it's all pretty. I've been grinding, grinding. Every single day. So like uh, there's this huge presence boost, but it just kind of goes in at those spots and I can see where the S-ing is actually happening up here. So you can get super surgical with it, but it's more like two EQ moves. Um, you know, uh, uh, this is the EOSIS, E-I-O-S-I-S, -S, E2, or E squared de -esser. Um This one actually is included with uh, the Slate Digital subscription to VMR and all of that. Um, um, Fabrice is actually the lead designer on all the VMR stuff, and he also kind of has his own brand, EOSIS, and so they kind of, you know, kind of put them together. So yeah, this is a really cool DSer. Um, I normally find that if I if I had to reach for this, like something's wrong. Um, you know, you can also go as simple as um, it's one of the reasons that I love Neutron is within here. Is let's say I put an EQ in. I've been grinding, grinding every single day. Okay. So let's say I do, let's say I, for some reason, I wanted an insane amount of air on his voice, but I wanted to DS him. I can turn on dynamic mode. I have a threshold right here. So I'll I've been grinding, grinding every single day. It kind of, so it kind of starts turning down. If I want it to be more aggressive, I can use it here. I've been grinding, grinding every single day. I've been grinding, grinding every single day. I've been grinding, grinding every single day. Now I'm drifting, drifting into outer space. Um, once again, these aren't these aren't good settings, and honestly, that's 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 a that's a very brittle sounding vocal. Now, um, please don't do that. Um, but um, but like even just dynamic EQ is a deesser, is a compressor. Like the like the lines are so blurred nowadays in our processors. Um, I can come into the transient shaper, which is kind of like a compressor, but it actually just follows envelope, which is another super deep dive on stuff. But like, yeah, I could totally come in here and be like, cool, I want to, you know, I've been grinding, grinding every single day. You know, so it's going to just turn down whenever there's a large change as opposed to being threshold dependent. I can give it more presence boost, or I could come in here then underneath. Be like, man, I need more S or more consonant, less sustain. I've been grinding, grinding every single day. 
I've been grinding, grinding every single then, but it's super smooth, super transparent. So uh, there's well, then, a billion different ways to approach it. And it kind of depends on what it is. Sometimes I want to hear a hard limited S. You know, maybe I'll put in a multi-band compressor up there and I just kill that thing. Maybe, you know, maybe I come in and I use a harmonic exciter and I like really push up hard on this to like really make it grungy and nasty sounding, you know. I've been grinding, grinding every you know, so I can, you know, drive a lot of distortion on it and then come back after it and EQ it back and then put some life back into it, you know, I could do that. I've been grinding, grinding every single day. Consistent kind of smooth, bright mm -hmm. sound to it, but then I can put an S back in it, you know. I've been grinding, grinding every single day. And now he has this consistent top presence above his S. I, and it's just like, are any of those right or wrong? What's right for the artist? What's right for the project? You know, what's the tone? Um, which, if you, uh, which actually, just in terms of all this, when I'm setting up the session and I'm importing my tracks and everything, and you have an artist just sitting there behind you, and you're like, you're just doing your thing, talk to them. That's the time to be like, hey, what's this track about? What are we doing? Like, what's is this part of a project? Like, what's going on here? That's your time to get a feel for what's going on, because that's gonna, that's gonna be, you know, that's gonna lead you to, well, what's right for this? You know, are we going for a period piece on this? You know, what's what's important to you? Hell, just hearing them talk and hearing their voice in front of you is important. Because if they hop on the mic and it sounds different, like what either are you making your voice sound different? Did I do something? Because ideally it should be the same. Um, you know, we're pretty close to it. Um, or at least it should be a bigger, more badass version when you hop on the mic. That's what everybody wants. <laughs> um, so, so anyways, yeah, like a million ways to skin that cat. But yeah. Just I whatever works. Yeah. The, um, so one thing I, I can always figure it out, but I have a problem um, with the mic, the settings, the um, the clock settings, like moving oh. from place to place. Okay. Yeah. Um, where where is it? I mean, I use it. The um well under? okay. The thing is, the clock settings are actually going to be defined by your interface with whatever. Okay. Almost always, um, you can have an external clock, like you know, old school, like an Apogee Big Ben rack piece. But the um, you, the session, the sample rate is going to be determined by when, by what you started the session at. So if you started at 48, Pro Tools requests the Apollo in this case to change the clock to 48 kilohertz. Um, I can come up and go into my settings right here. Well, actually, it's grayed out right now because Pro Tools is in control. But if I shut down Pro Tools, I could just change this sample rate to whatever. But that's the clock. The clock is literally the thing that's measuring the periods of time that it's telling it I take a sample of the audio. I think it's because I'm going to different studios, and right. if somebody's bringing their import sessions in, and they yes. do have a hard clock, they do have an external. Is you want to look at what they're running? Hopefully, they're once again they're doing music. It should be at a multiple of 44. Like I'm just, like, I'm just sorry. People, I people have tried to argue with, with me. Yeah, it is it is physics. Yeah. It is <laughs> physics. Like it is correct. Um, you know. Um, Anyway, so, so yeah, if it's at 44.1, if you're bringing in a, a session that's 48, that's why um, I am the import session dialog box. I go to source correction, 44.1, and I convert everything when I bring it in. Um, it just makes everything, yeah, because all of a sudden then you're having to shut the session down and reopen it and all of that stuff. Yeah, 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 I hate that. I hate that. Um, um, so, um, yeah, that's a good question. But um, What about bouncing versus printing it? Well, nowadays, with because um, we do um, offline rendering, that's effectively the same. You can still do a real time bounce, which you're used to. That's all. Right. Yeah, that's that's all. That's all you know. <laughs> so, it's 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 all good, man. <laughs> man, two two thousand eight needs some love. <laughs> yeah, man. Like, yeah, man. Um, um, um. Okay, yeah, so when we go to bounce, um, okay, uh, okay, it's a, it's a good question. Good, pra good practices on bouncing. Um, what's normally a really good idea to do is, um, is let's, say, let's say I did have to write in a fade out on the end of my song, and let's say the song actually is like, let's say faded out by here. Normally what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up and I'm going to throw that out of whatever my instrumental is. Um, let's, say, let's say the beat actually there's a run in or something and I'm starting it like a lot of times actually 
it's it's all right to just go ahead and start your stuff on bar nine a lot of times just because it gives you some extra running if an artist needs to start singing like or you know or start right in the beginning of the session you got to give them a run in two bars of metronome or something like that you're gonna put it at bar nine so normally what i like to do is i like to just trim this to whatever it needs to be and then when i go to bounce i hit that and it's going to be that length every time okay if i do a radio edit a show version all of that stuff they should all be the same the, the same uh, the same length of time you don't want one being two seconds longer well this time i came in we we worked on the mix and now there's two seconds of dead time at the beginning no nah, don't do that be consistent um and a good way is finding you know and you can use whatever you want even if you have to group audio so let's say like this was like this um once i hold shift and click you know that selects everything in that selection my hit control alt g or command alt g on mac i just made a group so even though these are all different pieces of audio my plugins will still shut themselves off here but i can now move them and edit them as if they were one group okay um so um yeah so yeah so i recommend uh yeah i definitely recommend doing uh doing that um yeah, so when you're ready to bounce, what do we not do? Go up to here and hit bounce to disc. Look at what it is. And here's the thing. If you have to do it and you don't remember that, that's fine. Do not allow yourself to click on this. Like, get to it and be like, ah, okay, control it, B, control it, B, control it, B, control it, B. Hey, my bounce to disc dialogue came up, okay? All right, so, so when bouncing, you should never be bouncing just wide open where it's just like, oh, Pro Tools is just going to go to the last piece of audio. Sometimes it nails it and gets the end of it. Sometimes it will queue up a 20-minute bounce. Um, so always, always select. That's what I say. Like take normally your instrumental or whatever and be like, that's the length of the song. Okay? So I hit my Control alt b and it pops up. It's asking me, where's my bounce source? In this case, I want to bounce from my monitor source, which I'm listening to on this interface. It'll be called different things, maybe A12, Line12, Out12. Whatever your master bus is set to, whatever you're listening to, you want to have it set to that. Because I could come in and be like, hey, bounce from the acapella bus. And now I will be running a bounce. It's just the acapella. You can do that, but just just physical output, which you are actually listening to, okay? Um, don't ever bounce direct to MP3. Bounce to a WAV file because you have this cool ability to make an MP3 in real time, okay? Um, for us, the way that we bounce, um, yeah, we're going to bounce in 24, 44, 1. Um, we actually use a different piece of software to make MP3s because we think it sounds better. It's called DB Power Amp. Um, it does variable bitrate encoding, so for an MP3, we get better quality for the same bitrate. Um, um, but yeah, like 24441. If I was delivering to CD, I'd hit 16 bit 441. Okay? Um, and then it's okay, so it's going to ask me what I want to name it. Seriously, you should be naming it the name of your session. This is why having a good name at the beginning of your session is important. We label things. Um, yeah, yeah, Untitled 3. Come on. Um, um, like, I mean, just what you had for lunch that day. Just something that you can remember. Um, so the way that we tag it is we then tag stuff versus off how finished we think the song is done. Is it just been recorded and tracked? Is it a rough mix? And for the record, a rough mix isn't like, oh, I just kind of mixed it, I can do better. A rough mix is the mix that is done at the time of recording. Like, because let's face it, an artist is on the mic, you're playing around with stuff. You're making it sound good in real time because that's part of the creative process. People don't just record and just mix anymore. It's a, it's a collaborative all the way through. Hey, put a beat drop there. Hey, I really want to hear a delay on this part. And you do it and then like, oh yeah, and I have a better feel for this. I want to re-perform that part because I get a different feel from it. Like, that's the way that this all should be working. So by the time you're done, even if it was a two-hour session and we were recording, it still has a mix on it. That's a rough mix, okay? So even when I get a, a session in from people and they're like, hey, we just want to mix this, I'm like, cool, where's your rough mix? And they're like, oh, but we just want it to be better than the rough mix. I'm like, that's cool. I have to hear your rough mix. Otherwise, I don't want to touch it because you already have these ideas in your head and I need to work off of that, okay? And even sometimes if I have a rough mix and then someone comes back, books more time, and then we keep mixing on it, cool. Then I'll actually tag it as a mix and keep versions of it, okay? Because how many times does someone come back and be like, hey, man, 
Dude, I love this one effect, man. I love the way the bass hit on RM2, like Rough Mix 2. Uh, but man, but I love how wide and rich everything is in Mix 5. Like, so can we look at that? And I look at the bounce state and I go to my session file backups that we set up to save 99 of them so I can find the date and time so I can look at the base settings on that versus what we're doing now. Like, it's a, this is all kind of like holistic, making your life easier. So that's why titling stuff, labeling your stuff, color coding your stuff, all of that will make your life easy. And if it hasn't made your life super easy yet, I promise you it will. Otherwise, you will be pulling your hair out. Um, so label your stuff with whatever naming scheme you want and it should always go into the bounced files folder okay um, if I go and take a look at this it's running this from our engineer playground session was man okay um, I go into my bounced files folder you actually see a whole bunch of stuff from recorded um, like, you know, apparently it was, you know, first we had just a regular recording. Um, um, I guess this is just, I guess this is literally just the hooks just recorded. I don't even know where it is. Anyways, somewhere in here is the hook. Um, and then we, and then someone else opened it up here and format and arranged the beat, okay? Um, and then we actually got the artists that performed this in and we just kind of had to clean up their vocals. You know, because there was a bunch of noise in that we recorded this on site, all of these vocals. So we had to clean them and denoise them. And then we actually went in and actually started mixing it. And then, you know, and then mastered it, you know. So, anyway, so like, you, we can track and by date all the work that was done to this, okay? Um, just from looking at the file. Okay? So it's really important that you keep track of all your stuff like that. Okay. Um, I think as far as being in the studio for today, we're at a stopping point. I know two hours is a lot to absorb and kind of listen to. And once again, like there's about a million things that I still didn't touch on. Um, and we could sit here for the rest of the day talking. Um, but if you would like to continue talking and also network and just talk to other people in the room, like everybody here does music, you should hang out. <laughs> Like seriously, like you learn a lot from each other. I know most of you guys probably work on music like more or less by yourself. Here at Parent Studios, like all the engineers, like we get together, we talk about stuff, we work on stuff, we train together, we critique each other, okay? That's how we get better. That's part of what makes us who we are and why we're always improving, okay? So like don't be an island, you know? It's, let's say, take your ego out of it and work with other people, you know? You will learn a lot. Even if it's things not to do, that's still valuable, okay? <laughs> you learn the biggest lessons from failure, okay? Don't get discouraged, so. Anyways, thanks for coming out for today. Um, 